Yes, th thank you, Chetan. I heard I was introduced in absentia this morning. Um, but my name is David Cox. I'll be joining ChemH in a few years. Um, I'm currently a hematology fellow here at Stanford, so I was in the hospital this morning. But um, I'm here now, and um, I uh, have a little bit of time in postdoc, and then I'll, I'm really excited to join the faculty here. I'll be part of the genetics department um, as well as ChemH. So I'm really looking forward to that, and um, looking forward to hearing our next speaker as well. So. I'm introducing um, Andrew Yang, um, who um, has had a really great career so far. So he uh, started at MIT, uh, was an engineering major in uh, mechanical engineering and material science there. Then he was um, here as kind of a part of ChemH. Um, he did his PhD in the lab of Tony Weiss Corre, and so he was part of the ChemH CBI um, program here. And recently he's been a um, a Sandler Fellow at UCSF, where he's doing really interesting work um, on the cellular and molecular bi biology of the blood-brain barrier. So I'm really excited to hear what he has to say. Welcome, Andrew. Thanks, David, for that kind introduction. It's incredible to be back. Um, to celebrate Sarah Fan Kemmage's 10-year anniversary, like David mentioned, I was a CBI student, cohort number two, for anyone else in my cohort? <laughs> um, and it was really CBI that pushed me to venture from engineering to new fields, including neurosciences, we'll discuss in a bit. <clears throat> um, our lab at UCSF, we started last year, um, we seek to understand the meaning, the mechanisms, the therapeutic potential of crosstalk between the brain and the body. In other words, um, is the blood-brain barrier more than just a barrier? And so in the next 10 minutes, I um, just want to preview um, what we're working on. And so, as you know, uh, brain health, tissue health in general, depends on vascular function. And since the work of Andreas Vesalius in the 16th century, we've known that wherever there are nerves in your body, there are dedicated blood vessels right there next to them to support their health. And nowhere is this more true than in the brain, with its billions of neurons and many more connections that make us who we are. Um, I like to think um, of the blood-brain barrier um, as kind of a specialized home for the brain. And the most famous of the specialized properties includes its impermeability, right? And so like any good home, you've got to have physical walls to keep you sheltered from the vicissitudes of the environment. Um, but any good home is also going to have windows, doors to let the groceries in, nutrients in, to clear the waste out, take the garbage out. Um, thermostat, right, to keep everyone homeostatic and happy at the right temperature. And I think in a modern home, uh, we couldn't live without Wi-Fi or cellular communication, right? <laughs> and I think these same functions are going to be increasingly appreciated at our blood-brain barrier. And that's what we want to figure out with, by developing new chemical biology tools. And there's just one takeaway. It's that brain health is dynamically regulated by this complex community of cell types that we call the blood-brain barrier. And our lab is focused really on touching on these two points. And we organize ourselves, therefore, according to two questions, right? What are the rules of communication across the blood-brain barrier? What distinguishes the cells and the proteins that can make it in versus those that can't? And what happens when those rules break down? How does that contribute to neurogenic disease? And these are supported by two recent papers. Um, but I'd like to really just focus on the first one um, here, where we're trying to develop these chemical biology tools to really get a first catalog of what are those proteins that can enter the brain and what are their entryways in there. And so this is the, the idea. We can take hundreds of proteins and tag them, in this case, let's say with the fluorophore, and then wait and see which of them make it into the brain. And that's what I'll touch upon for the rest of the talk. But just as a preview, what the rest of the lab is currently working on are interesting phenomena like the opposite, right? How is waste cleared from the brain, right? What are the proteins that are efficiently drained out versus those that don't? Because almost 70 to 80% of brain proteins are drained through the blood-brain barrier. And why are some, like amyloid beta and Alzheimer's, resistant to that? And then finally, moving beyond soluble proteins, can we develop new tools, for example, new proximity labeling tools, to track how immune cells gain access to the brain? What are their paths and portals, right? Can we have an immune cell that wherever it swims in the body, it's laying a trail of breadcrumbs, right? So we can tr uh, image its migration history. Um, but for the rest of today, we'll focus on this first part, because that's what I've worked on in Tony's lab here at Stanford and ChemH. 
And the context really begins over a century ago from the work of Paul Ehrlich, Goldman, Riesen Karnofsky, Lewandowski, and others that um, inject, and they injected the assortment of exogenous tracers. In this case, this textile dye, Tripan Blue, Evans Blue. And when they did that, they saw that this dye would disperse throughout the body, except for the brain. And this is our first inkling that the vasculature of the brain might be a little bit more specialized. And in interestingly, today, um, recently, this is still the mode of operation for how we study the blood-brain barrier, right? We take one of these dyes, Evans Blue, just like in that cartoon image I showed you, and we inject it into our rodent, and then we ask a binary. Is there a leakage or is there not, right? And this made me wonder then, um, after I took Chem 227 with Carolyn, right, are there ways to more systematically evaluate the blood-brain barrier, right? Just like we have CRISPR screens now that can evaluate what happens inside of a cell um, at scale, can we use chemical biology to interrogate what happens between cells at scale, right? And so that was a motivation for a lot of the work I did in Tony's lab in collaboration with Carolyn and others, where we developed um, techniques to be able to sprinkle in to not just one protein, but entire proteomes consisting of hundreds of proteins, azides, biorthogonal groups, so that we can follow them as they're secreted from that cell and they move throughout the mouse's body. We also then found even simpler ways where we can just take the entire plasma proteome and using NHS ester chemistries, we can just tag those thousands of proteins as well. And by both approaches, we can then image or do enrichment mass spectrometry to identify the source, the destination, and the mechanisms by which these interesting proteins are moving throughout the body, especially across the blood-brain barrier. And so when we do that, when we, for example, transfer labeled proteomes, not just Evans Blue, but now hundreds of proteins that might more um, better reflect what's physiologically happening, we caught a glimpse of an interesting phenomenon where there might be more transport of these proteins across the healthy blood-brain barrier into neurons and the hippocampus and the stratum and the cortex. Um, and what we thought, think is going on is contrary to what the textbook have, which they claim that there's no transcellular transport. Um, we think that there's plenty of this. What it depends on, though, is the type of tracer you use to study the blood-brain barrier, right? So if you take a dye or a fluorophore, like a dextrin, and inject it, it'll be relatively inert. But if you, all of a sudden you inject what it's natively exposed to in circulation, the blood plasma proteome, the hundreds and thousands of proteins, all of a sudden you can see this receptor-mediated entry. We believe there's an array of diverse receptors that can mediate transport through. And you can see here, if you just take any vessel from a healthy mouse and stain it for clathrin, which is the downstream vesicle of uh, ligand-selective receptor-mediated transcytosis, you see a high density of these vessels. A ves a vesicles were uh, in contrast to what was claimed previously. So of course, uh, this is an interesting phenomenon, but what are these proteins, right? What are these receptors? And that is what we're working on now at UCSF, a heroic, heroic effort by Amanda and how you're in the lab in collaboration with Al Berlingame. Um, we are tagging plasma, not with fluorophores, but now with um, click moieties, injecting them into mice, waiting, perfusing those mice so there's no residual blood left, and then fishing out what the proteins are that make it into the brain. At the same time, we want to identify what the potential surface receptors are that's mediating this selective entry. And so here we can just perfuse mice, example with NHS esters or WGA HRP following inspiration from Jim Wells, um, and identify what those proteins are. And in both cases, we take advantage of this click enrichment and elution for mass spectrometry. And though this seems really straightforward, um, it has been a doozy to figure out how to get this to work, but we think we're close. Um, and what we want to do, and I'll show you an example of this next, is we think we can then use existing um, ligand receptor data sets that folks have generated for single cell analysis to identify which of the surface proteome um, could be potentially functional receptors. Right? We can use the proteins that we think are entering the brain from the plasma and pair them with their cognate receptor. Right? Um, and therefore um, identify good targets for antibodies to be able to enter the brain. And we can do this in health, in aging, and disease. All right, so what does this look like? We think this, the set of predicted functional transport proteins on your blood-brain barrier. And what we have on the right are those proteins that go up with age. And on the left are the proteins that we think diminish with aging, right? So there's less of these. And um, interestingly, this target, transferrin receptor,
This is the basis for over 10 pharmaceutical companies' brain shuttles. This is the one single target the field has. We see that it diminishes with age on the blood-brain barrier. We confirm this in human um, brain endothelial cells and Alzheimer's disease, and suge suggest that there's a smaller therapeutic window then um, if you want to use this target um, to treat um, age-related diseases. And so we wondered, well, why don't we just take one of these targets on the right-hand side and try to administer an antibody against it? And so that's what we're doing now. Here's one example of what that looks like. Here's an antibody that we predict goes up with normal aging. And when you inject that into an aged mouse um, at a relatively modest dose, 10 mg a kg, and you wait a day, um, you can see target engagement on the brain endothelium, the brain vasculature. But what was really interesting to us is if you co-stain it with a marker for myeloid cells, here in this case, EBA1, um, you can see plenty of microglia that take up our antibody. And this is not the case for the IgG control, right? And so this interesting um, observation, maybe in hindsight, um, should make sense because if you imagine we have a large enough list of uh, receptors on our blood-brain barrier, some of those will also be shared by cells of the brain, right? So microglia will share the same receptor that the blood-brain barrier has. And so when you administer your antibody, your antibody will cross and then home to a specific cell type, right? And so what our lab is now doing is we're testing 15, 20 or so antibodies to try to create a suite of um, brain cell type specific antibodies, right? We can have an astrocyte antibody or a microglia antibody or a neuron antibody, or even um, antibodies that target a cell state, right? So there's these disease associated microglia that are inflamed. Can we have antibodies that can selectively traffic to them, right? Um, and so with that, I hope I've convinced you that um, by developing these new chemical biology approaches that are scalable, we can begin to chip away and learn the rules of how this crosstalk between brain and body occurs at our blood-brain barriers, and that we can begin then to harness our understanding of these rules to create new therapies to treat neurodegenerative diseases. Um, and with that, I want to thank my mentors um, at Stanford, my PI, Tony, our collaborators, Carolyn, Josh, Michelle, and others, and then of course, um, Serafan Chemh. Um, this was, I think, one of our first retreats in 2017. You can see I'm kind of shrinking in the back here. Um, <laughs> But, but it really was incredible because with ChemH, we had a cohort of classmates and faculty that would all encourage you to break down barriers between disciplines. And that same daring and sense of adventure is what I'm trying to carry now into my own lab at UCSF. And so with that, I'd like to thank you and answer your questions. Thank you so much for that. Um, I had a specific question. You mentioned that there were age-related changes in the blood-brain barrier that you um, had noticed. Does that depend on the region of the brain? Does it change by region? It's a wonderful question. And the short answer is yes, it does. Um, when we've done this brain region-specific analysis, what we find is you can compartmentalize it into three broad groups, at least for the blood-brain barrier. You have the uh, forebrain, kind of the cortex and hippocampus. You have the stratum, and then you have the cerebellum. Um, and the properties can differ drastically. So for example, vitamin A transport, or straw 6, one of the receptors that we nominated here, um, is enriched in the stratum, but not at all seen in the forebrain or the cerebellum. What, is it, what does that mean neurologically? Very interesting, we don't know. Andrew, uh, in the back. Oh. Great talk, great to see you again. You know, we worked together uh, for a little bit in, to in Tony's lab. I, I love the direction. I'm gonna, I'm gonna flip the script, uh, the script a little bit away from proteins to small molecules. So it's widely known that the blood-brain barrier gets leaky when uh, you, know, you get brain damage or, or with age. Um, and people have focused on what the proteins are and the elimination of some of those age-related proteins. I'm gonna ask a small molecule question. Has anyone studied uh, an increase in brain distribution of drugs in the elderly? And if so, the mechanisms that cause that, is that uh, improved entry of those compounds or a reduction in the efflux? I'm thinking about things like Lipitor, which where we can do liver-directed delivery of whether we can now hijack some of those mechanisms to get greater brain penetration for, for some therapeutics. It's a wonderful question. It depends. <laughs> um, and it depends on the small molecule itself, of course, right? Um, I, because there are at least two, 
two or three variables at play, right? There's the influx, which like you mentioned, can ca be caused by a leakage. There is a loosening of paracellular tight junctions that are relevant then for small molecules, maybe less so for macromolecules like proteins. There's also a concomitant change in these efflux pumps like the PGPs, right? And that's why it depends on the, mo on the small molecule itself, right? Um, I haven't seen a systematic analysis across molecules of interest. It's a great question. Do you, this vesicular transcytotic mechanism you were alluding to, what is known about what determines the frequent, the eff efficacy of that? Is it mostly mm -hmm. the identity of the receptor that you endocytose with, or is it just the flux of those vesicles going in? It's a, that's a wonderful question as well, and it does depend. So it depends on the receptor, of course, but interestingly, it also depends on the ligand itself, and this is something that pharmaceutical and biotech companies have um, learned the, and, and figured out insights the, the hard way, but basically for an antibody, right, you can have the same target, same transferrin receptor, you can have drastically different degrees of transport based on the antibody itself, and it depends on affinity, um, it depends on the epitope you're targeting, right, um, and other variables, but they found that, for example, you don't want the highest affinity antibody, right? If you have, let's say, a five nanomolar or, or stronger affinity antibody, it just gets sorted into the lysosome and doesn't productively transcytose through. Whereas if it's too weak, it won't bind at all. So the sweet spot, empirically, folks have found is you want something between 50 and 200 nanomolars, right? So that's just one example of affinity, but the epitope also matters. People have found for transferrin receptor, if you target certain domains, Again, it'll be unproductively cycled through. It won't transcytose. I have a question. Um, oh, it might be basic, but we always think about blood-brain barrier in one direction, but is there another mechanism to remove like metabolic waste, and is there efforts in trying to co-op that to try to figure out other ways of crossing the blood-brain barrier? Yes. Um, there are... I mean, the blood-brain barrier plays an incredibly important role in the clearance of waste products in the brain. The brain is highly metabolically active. It generates a lot of waste. And it's this reverse transcytosis um, that, that, that is thought to mediate this. For example, the receptor LRP1, also through clathrin, is believed to mediate the removal of amyloid beta, which is a byproduct of metabolism. Um, I don't know as much about the removal of metabolic waste products like CO2 and so on, but um, there are well worked out mechanisms, and the blood brain bear plays a critical role in that. Um, that was our last question. Um, so, if we thank uh, Andrew for his talk. <laughs>